Hello, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this live webinar which we're hosting today along with Amethyst Radio Surgery on the topic of the modern management of brain metastases. So our goal today will be to discuss some challenging cases of brain metastases and explore the potential treatment options and limitations of gamma knife radio surgery. We've got a stellar panel of speakers to walk us through these complexities, including uh, consultant physicists, medical oncologists, consultant neurosurgeons, and a representative from our charity, the National Brain Appeal. They're all leaders in their field. And firstly, I'd like to introduce Ian Paddock, who is our first speaker. He's the chief physicist at the Queen Square Radio Surgery Center, and he's got over 24 years experience in gamma knife physics. He's been instrumental in commissioning numerous gamma knife models and won multiple awards. He currently holds the position of the president of the British Radio Surgery Society and continues to drive advancements in the fields of radio surgery physics. He'll be talking to you today for the next 15 minutes or so on exploring the technical scope of gamma knife radio surgery. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much, Kieran, for the kind introduction there. So I'm going to be exploring the technical scope of gamma knife for the treatment of uh, brain metastases. Um, and exploring the limits for, for gamma knife for brain metastases. Are there any limits? Uh, how many is too many? Uh, we know that treatments should provide clinical efficacy. They should be safe. So they should deliver a low dose to the normal brain tissue. They shouldn't provide a disproportionate drain on staff resources, so we shouldn't have treatments that are too long. Um, and they should provide good value for healthcare providers. So what about clinical uh, efficacy to start with? Well, I was privileged enough to be uh, involved in the first double digit brain metastasis treatment in Europe. Uh, which was, I, I believe it was the first in Europe, certainly the first in the UK in 1999. Uh, we had a 40-year-old patient that was uh, had uh, 10 metastases. They were referred with, I think, two or three. Uh, but when we did a double-dose contrast scan, we found 10. Um, we were going to refuse the patient treatment, but the, the patient somehow talked us into delivering the treatment and she was alive uh, 11 years later. And that made us realize that there are a subset of patients that do incredibly well, um, even though they have a large number of, of metastases. So the treatment should certainly be safe. It should give a low dose to the normal brain tissue. Um, and I've heard it said, well, if you're treating 10 metastases with gamma knife, then it's the equivalent of whole brain radiotherapy. Um, and I took exception to that. So I did a little study uh, where I compared, compared conventional whole brain radiotherapy delivered with a LINAC, 30 grain, 10 fractions. I also looked at uh, an IMRT treatment. So this was tomotherapy that was 30 gray to normal brain with a 10 gray boost to a number of metastases. And then I chose a tricky gamma knife case, which was one with 28 metastases. And what I've done here is I plotted those three treatments all on the same dose volume histogram. So the area under each of these curves represents the total radiation burden to the brain. And you can see, not surprisingly, LINAC uh, delivers the highest radiation burden to the brain, or at least should I say whole brain radiotherapy delivers the highest radiation burden. Uh, followed by uh, the tomotherapy treatment with um, a 10 gray boost. Um, and you can see that gamma knife is dramatically lower. Now, some people would say, well, gamma knife is a single fraction and you're comparing it with a whole uh, fractionated treatment of whole brain radiotherapy, which maybe isn't uh, fair. So let's just compare uh, gamma knife here with one fraction, that's a three gray fraction of whole brain radiotherapy. And you can see even for this extreme case, the areas under the curve are approximately the same. So gamma knife is, even for a complex case, 
uh, uh, comparable with a single fraction of whole brain radiotherapy. I've also heard it said by clinicians that, well, if there are 10 METs at treatment, then there'll be 10 more when it comes to the, the next follow-up. Um, and this is some very early work that I did um, before the advent of uh, targeted therapies. Um, I looked at a series of patients treated in London. Uh, about a third of them were retreated due to the development of new metastases, 33%. And you can ask yourself the question, well, do the presenting number of metastases predict the need for further treatment? Or you can switch this around, and it's a very easy question to answer. Do patients that require further treatments present with more metastases in the beginning? So here in this table, I have uh, patients treated with one treatment session and those treated between, with between two and six uh, SRS sessions. And you can see the mean number of metastases in both groups is about five, and there's no statistically significant difference between the two. But if you look at the overall survival, there is a dramatic difference, 10 months versus 25 months, and that was statistically significant. So this data, I think, very simply demonstrates that retreatment is given to patients who live longer not to patients who have higher numbers of metastases at the first presentation. So our current limits um, in terms of NHS funding and, and our own uh, limits when patients are presented at the MDT is uh, a total volume of no more than 20 cc's, um, but we don't count the number of metastases. But let's have a look at this case. This is a, a patient with a total volume of 20 uh, cubic centimetres, treated in 2007 for six brain metastases. And this patient was alive with no further progression 12 years later. So there are even some uh, patients with a large uh, total volume that can do well. Uh, this is a patient that we treated at, at Queen Square Radio Surgery Centre, a 33-year-old female, first diagnosed in 2009 with stage four breast cancer. Multiple brain metastases were found in 2018. Whole brain radiotherapy was recommended at her local centre. She refused that and presented herself to the uh, MDT at, at Queen Square in January 2018 and was accepted for treatment. So, the first treatment was in January 2018, 15 targets, but the total volume was less than one cc. And you can see the mean dose of the brain extremely low, just 1.1 gray. The patient returned six months later and a further 23 targets were treated. But because the patient had had follow up, these lesions were very small and just 0.73 cc's uh, of tumor volume was treated. And then the patient returned again, this time four months later for 21 targets, but the total volume was less than half, uh, was around half a cc. And you could be saying, well, in November 2018, we're really losing the battle here, aren't we? But amazingly, the patient uh, survived disease-free for another three and a half years before they presented themselves again uh, and they were treated for nine targets in March 2022 and then again for a fifth treatment in December 2022 where we treated a total of 30 lesions over two days with the gamma knife. Um, so the patient eventually succumbed to their disease, but that was 6.4 years since the first uh, SRS treatment. So when we prescribe doses, um, why do we prescribe the doses that we do? Um, and, and these doses here are, you know, some, I think people think that they, you know, uh, arrived on earth in tablets of stone, but actually they, they were um, derived from a dose escalation study. It's called the RTOG905 study, um, where they divided uh, tumors between those that were less than two cc's, between two and three, sorry, uh, less than 
two cubic cent uh, centimeters in diameter, between two and three centimeters in diameter, and greater than three centimeters in diameter. Um, what people don't know about this is that um, all of these patients had been previously treated. So when sometimes clinicians are um, reluctant to refer a patient for radiosurgery because the patient's previously been treated with, let's say, whole brain, um, well, we know that it's safe because all of these patients um, were shown to have a low rate of toxicity, even though they had all had previous treatment. And some of these patients had primary uh, disease, so um, glioblastoma, for instance, and they had received up to 60 gray. What's also interesting is if you look at the quality of the treatments, this is a very early study, and the, the mean conformity index for gamma knife was 1.4, which means that uh, 1.4 times the, the target volume was being treated. Um, but you can see for LINAC, it was 2.7. So almost three times as much uh, volume was treated as the, the actual uh, tumor. And yet these were all shown to be uh, safe treatments. And here you can see on the right of this table, you can see the uh, toxicity. So in the, the group with less than two centimeters in diameter, uh, there were no acute cases of toxicity at all. Um, recently, we've um, started treating larger metastases because these are the ones where you can't give a very large dose in a single fraction uh, with stage radiotherapy. Uh, radio surgery. Um, this can be done with uh, 10 gray sessions, two weeks apart. Um, and this was originally uh, proposed by Higuchi from Japan uh, around 15 years ago. Well, this was the very first case treated in the UK at um, the uh, Amethyst uh, Center at Thornbury in Sheffield. Um, this patient was presented at MDT with a very large uh, brainstem met from breast. Uh, and a number of other lesions. And uh, the uh, oncologist didn't want to treat with whole brain and the, the radio surgeon didn't really want to treat with single fraction radio surgery. And I suggested uh, stage radio surgery, which we uh, decided to do. Uh, so we delivered 10 gray to this lesion and treated the other lesions at the same time. Then the patient returned, the tumor had significantly shrunk two weeks later and we delivered another 10 gray. And you can see the follow up here with the follow ex extending to 17 months. At that point, the patient was lost to follow up. Um, but uh, at that point, 17 months later, she was treated for new uh, lesions. The patient returned to work during that time. Uh, and I had the pleasure of meeting them at that point. We can also um, use uh, adaptive stage SRS for metastasis near organs at risk. So this is a case of a uh, a metastasis in the pituitary stalk, uh, abutting the optic apparatus. So clearly you, you can't give a large dose there. Uh, but here we gave uh, three stages of radiosurgery, uh, approximately 10 gray for each stage. And we got a dramatic reduction of, of um, a 67% reduction um, over those three stages. And you can see that here where originally the tumor was abutting the optics, but then it pulled away as it shrunk and we were able to give a, a higher dose with each stage of radiosurgery. So in conclusion, I, I think focal treatment of, of between one and 30 metastases is, is easy to deliver with the gamma knife. And, and patients with many metastases, so that's greater than 10, can be treated safely with low brain dose and often with good survival. And the advent of targeted therapies means that brain metastasis control can significantly prolong survival. And then larger lesions can be treated via a staged adaptive SRS instead of conventional fractionation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Ian, a really comprehensive overview there and gives a real flavor of, I suppose, the extent of 
the limits of treatment for gamma knife now and how it's really expanded in terms of its scope um, in both the number and the degree of metastases that can be treated. Um, so we've got some questions coming through. What we'll do is we'll pull those together and we'll address them at the end. So I'll, I'll say thank you for now, Ian, and we'll come back to you later and we'll move on to our second speaker. So next will be Dr. Thomas Carter. Dr. Carter is a consultant medical oncologist working at the busy Mount Vernon Cancer Centre in Northwest London, where he's also an honorary clinical lecturer for the University College London. He has a particular interest and focus on melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers, as well as adult gliomas. And he holds a PhD in cancer nan nanotechnology with research interests in melanoma. So that's the topic he'll be speaking on today, melanoma brain metastases management in the era of immunotherapeutics. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, Kieran. So um, thanks very much for the invitation to talk at this webinar. Um, it's always a bit of a unique thing having a medical oncologist talk at um, a meeting which is predominantly about radiotherapy. And it's really interesting to hear um, Ian talk about what we really can do for patients with very tricky to get to metastases at this point. So as Kieran said, I I'll talk to you today about what we can do as an adjunct to gamma knife treatment and what we can offer melanoma patients who have uh, brain metastases in regards to systemic treatments. As we know, in the last 15 years, there's been lots of breakthroughs and advances in the, in the overall management of melanoma. So first of all, some statistics. Melanoma is one of the cancers which continues to increase in the UK over the last 30 years. There's been a steady um, increase in the number of patients we're seeing with melanoma. Although we're better at recognising melanoma and there's more awareness about what to look out for, a significant proportion of our patients still present with advanced disease and around 15% actually present with no obvious primary melanoma with just um, metastatic disease at presentation. Of those people we see with advanced disease, up to about 30%, depending on what case series you look at, also have visible brain metastases at presentation. And historically, up to about 60% of patients with advanced disease develop brain metastases at some point in their disease journey. In terms of the scale of the problem, Melanoma brain metastases account for around 10% of all brain metastases, uh, and this is behind breast cancer and lung cancer. So what can we do? From a medical oncology perspective, the treatment options for advanced melanoma fall into two main categories. The first category that I'll focus the talk today on is on immune checkpoint inhibitors. We have three different, combination, different combinations we can offer to patients with first-line disease. Combination ipilimab, nivolumab, pem, single agent pembrolizumab, and then a new combination, nivolumab, relatinumab. Depending on the choice of agent you give to patients, which does depend on their fitness and how well you think they'll tolerate side effects, we see durable responses to these treatments of between about 30 and 50%. However, they do come with problems. The toxicity from immune checkpoint inhibitors can be challenging. Some of it can be lifelong, and also some of it can be life-threatening. So it's very important that our patients are well-versed in what we're trying to do for them, but what we, what we expose them to as a risk as well. The other mainstay of treatment is BRAF-directed tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatments. Uh, a few combinations available, dorafenib and trametinib, n and binametinib. But these are, of course, only effective in those patients who have the specific BRAF V600 mutation. And this is around about 45% of all melanoma patients. Good response rates, up to about 80%, but sometimes the response rates of these drugs is short-lived. They're well tolerated and they do have good CNS penetration. How durable is durable? So we talked about immunotherapy gives us durable responses. This was a recently presented update on the um, groundbreaking, check, groundbreaking Checkmate 067 study, which presented at ESMO this year. You can see here that actually the 10-year follow-up data shows that actually 52% of patients remain alive after 10 years. So we don't like to use the word cure in the, in the medical oncology field, but in effect, what we're doing for these patients is trying to give them long-term control of their melanoma. And we discharge people from, from follow-up with us having had these treatments. So I thought what I'd do is I'd illustrate how we sort of decide what to offer for patients with, with melanoma brain metastases by going through a couple of case studies. So the first case I'll talk about is a patient with um, 
who presented with a stage 2B melanoma, he's 53, young, on his left forearm, did his BRAF status and we found that he was wild type, so he won't benefit from BRAF directed therapy. His baseline staging scan showed that he actually had very bulky left axillary nodal disease, which was deemed to be unreceptible by our surgical colleagues. On the first MRI of his brain, unfortunately, we also found he had an isolated right cerebellum metastasis with some bleeding around it. We met him. He was very well. He was asymptomatic. He had a bit of pain from his auxiliary disease, but he had a good performance status. We took him, we discussed him with the Gamma Knife team who said, yeah, definitely suitable for SRS, but we need the hemorrhage to settle. So we started him on combination immunotherapy with ipilimab and nivolumab. After three cycles of treatment, not unexpectedly, he developed some toxicity. He had some liver toxicity. He also developed a facial nerve palsy, which we thought was probably immunotherapy related. So we interrupted treatment. We gave him some steroids to get this toxicity under control, and we did some scans. And very reassuring, we found that his scans showed a partial response to treatment, not just in the auxiliary disease, but also in the brain. The bleeding had settled, and his lesion was smaller. We opted not to proceed with gamma knife treatment, given that he'd responded. We carried on. We reinitiated maintenance nivolumab treatment. And after 15 months, his scans show that he's in complete response, both extracranially and intracranially, and he remains on treatment. He's doing really well. This is just to illustrate some of the images from this patient's case. They might not be reflective in the same sequence each time, but it's the, it's the, the, the best way of visualizing what's going on at the time. So we can see here he had a, a hemorrhagic met at the presentation. After eight weeks, significant improvement in the appearances of that. And after 15 months, you can just see some area where the, the lesion once was, but no evidence of any active disease. So why did we give him immunotherapy and not give him gamma knife? So is immunotherapy effective against CNS disease? The answer is sometimes. Checkmate 204 was a study which was done looking at patients with brain metastases. And what we found with this study was actually the combination of giving ipilimumab and nivolumab immunotherapy is similarly effective inside the brain compared to outside the brain, as long as the patients are asymptomatic from their disease. You can see here the blue line at the top represents the extracranial progression-free survival rate with the orange line representing the intracranial um, progression-free survival rate and the green line representing the overall. And there's a very little difference between those curves. But when we looked at the actual rate of uh, control of patients, we can see in patients with asymptomatic disease, you get control rates of around 60%, which drops massively to about 15% in patients with symptomatic brain disease. This is probably because these lesions are bigger. The patients require corticosteroids. These are immunosuppressive. And we know when we're trying to harness people's immune system with immunotherapy, being on immunosuppressive treatments at the start is not ideal. For some reason, giving single agent PD-1 treatment, which is something we reserve for patients who are less fit, is much less effective than giving the combination therapy. So we see responses to single agent PD-1 therapy around half compared to those we see extracranially. So we do something a little bit different when patients can't have a combination immunotherapy. The second case I'll talk about, a little bit different. Again, another young patient. This is a 49-year-old lady. She actually has a history of two prior melanomas, both early stage. She completed five years of clinical follow-up and was discharged. Eight years later, after her initial melanoma was resected, she presented with generalized seizures. MRI scan was done and we found at least five brain lesions with lots of edema. She had a CT scan, showed she has some extracranial disease in her lung, some nodal disease. A biopsy is done and we also found she is BRAF mutant. So we also have the option of targeted therapy in this lady's case. Once again, we meet her. We find she's having her seizures managed with dexamethasone and levetiracetam. She's asymptomatic from an extracranial disease. She's got a performance status of one. And she's doing all right. She has a borderline LDH. We can use an LDH to help guide us on the overall burden and pace of melanoma. And we know that patients who have a normal LDH in general do better than patients who have an elevated LDH. Because of this symptomatic brain disease, we referred her for some gamma knife treatment. At the time of gamma knife, she had 10 lesions. These were all treated. We then met her back in clinic. We weaned her off the steroids and we started her on ipilimab and nivolumab. She also developed toxicity after two cycles of treatment, this time colitis, managed it with IV steroids, 
some infliximab, did some scans, and actually showed she had a partial response to treatment. We got her back onto maintenance nivolumab. She completed 19 cycles, but unfortunately had to stop treatment before the standard two years because she developed a rebound colitis as well as some hepatitis, which again was managed with, with immunosuppression. How she is doing now, three and a half years after we started her immunotherapy, she's had a complete response. She's got a very small area of radiation necrosis around one of the lesions, uh, which has been checked with perfusion imaging and shown not to be disease. And she's completely asymptomatic from this. These images here just represent the small uh, lesions she had in both cerebral hemispheres and a large um, lesion towards the front of her brain, which was symptomatic. Looking at this lesion after 12 months, things look stable. And then again, three years later, there's stable appearances of lesion. And when, when she und underwent perfusion imaging, this was all just found to be a little bit of radiation necrosis. So in this patient's case, why did we give immunotherapy at first when we also have the option of target therapy, which has a better disease control rate? So the dream Seek study was done just to compare how we should sequence treatments in patients who have BRAF mutant disease. The way the trial was designed was uh, one arm was given ipilimumab and nivolumab up front, followed by dibrafenib and trametinib at progression, followed by the opposite sequence. And actually the trial was stopped early because patients given immunotherapy up front do significantly better than those who were given targeted therapy up front. Looking at the start of the curve, you can see because of the better responses to targeted therapy, that initially it seems that those patients do better, but around the, the nine month mark, the curves rapidly cross over and we find that patients who are given immunotherapy preferentially first, followed by targeted therapy at failure, do significantly better than the other way around. I think it's really important to highlight that, unfortunately, just by everything we have available to us, we can't always win with these patients. So the third case I'm going to present is not quite so optimistic. This is another young lady. She was diagnosed with a stage 3C melanoma of her left mid-back also found to have a BRAF mutation, and her initial staging scans were completely clear. So she went on to adjuvant BRAF protected therapy, which aims to reduce the risk of her melanoma relapsing, and she tolerated this very well for about nine months. We always scan patients whenever they're on adjuvant treatment, and nine months into, the, into her treatment, we unfortunately found three very small subcentimeter brain metastases on her scan. She was asymptomatic, as we previously discussed. We switched her to combination Ipilimumab with a short interval scan. We rescanned her after two cycles of combination immunotherapy, and unfortunately, we found she'd progressed. We discussed it with the Gamma Knife team, and she underwent Gamma Knife treatment for the for the visible brain lesions. Shortly after that, she developed pretty significant toxicity from immunotherapy in the form of Guillain-Barré syndrome and ascending polyneuropathy. We had to treat her with intravenous steroids and also with some intravenous immunoglobulins. We did a further scan eight weeks after her completion of her gamma knife treatment, which unfortunately showed she'd further progressed, not just in the lesions that we treated with gamma knife, but she had new brain disease. So we had no other option given that she was at this point not suitable for further gamma knife treatment other than to switch her back to BRAF directed therapy. Seven months after starting this, she had further progression within the brain. And again, because of the volume of disease, because of the location of the lesions, this just wasn't suitable for any further gamma knife. We did continue her BRAF directed therapy, given that we know that continuing these drugs post progression can temper the pace of disease and actually can buy patients um, a decent amount of time. However, very sadly, 12, 12 months after starting um, her targeted therapy in the metastatic setting, she, she died from her disease. And here we just show some of the images from this patient. So you can see here uh, the first set of images is very, very tiny lesions visible, which appeared while she was on adjuvant treatment. Just eight weeks into immunotherapy, these had progressed quite significantly, requiring some gamma knife treatment, which she successfully underwent. But unfortunately, she didn't respond. And again, about a further eight weeks later, she had new disease, progression of some of the lesions, although with some maintained response of others. So we had no choice but to switch her back to targeted therapy. So targeted therapy, it can be effective. It's much better in patients who don't have brain disease. So the top kaplan Meyer curve we're showing you here is an amalgamation of data from two clinical trials looking at the combination of dibrafenib and trametinib in patients with metastatic melanoma without brain disease. 
And we see the average duration of benefit for these patients is around 12 months. But there is a tail of the curve. So around a fifth of patients are actually still alive at five years and doing all right with treatment. We don't see the same thing in brain disease. So the COMBI-MB study looked at the efficacy of targeted therapy in patients with brain disease. You can see that actually the average duration of benefit in these patients is about half, about six months. And very few get significant benefit past 18 months. So just to highlight that we do need better treatments for them. And we do often need to think about combining systemic treatments with gamma knife so that we give our patients the best outcome. So just a little summary, just to highlight some of the decisions we make and, and the thoughts that go through our head when we meet a patient for the first time with brain metastases, for people with asymptomatic disease, good performance status, who have no contraindication to combination immunotherapy. That's what we go for. We can either give them SRS alongside up front if they're suitable, or we can consider doing it after two cycles. And one of the arguments for delaying this is that there is a, some evidence that giving immunotherapy together with gamma knife may increase the risk of radionecrosis. And given that we know that we can cure some of these patients, trying to minimize the risk of that is something that we we're quite keen to do. Patients who are not fit enough for combination immunotherapy, we do give them upfront gamma knife and we do refer them for that. And then we give them whichever immunotherapy they're appropriate for, whether it's pembrolizumab or nivolumab relatinumab. People who have symptomatic disease, who are suitable for vocal therapy, that's the priority. So referring them for gamma knife treatment and then follow that up with the immunotherapy that they're appropriate for, ideally once they're off the steroids and we know that the immunotherapy is going to be more effective in those patients. The challenging cases are those who have symptomatic brain disease, which is not suitable for focal therapy. If they have a BRAF mutation, we can offer that and we tend to start that pretty promptly. But if they don't have a BRAF mutation, these patients don't respond and don't do well with any treatment. And unfortunately, the majority of these patients, we recommend best supportive care. I think the caveat with any of the decisions above is that we also have to take into account the burden, the pace, and also the sites of all their extracranial disease. Some patients do present with just CNS disease, but the majority of people also have disease outside the brain. We've got to take all that into account when making any treatment decisions. Thanks for listening to my summary of systemic treatment today, and I'm happy to take any questions after the talks are finished. Thanks, Tom. Really incredible talk there. Um, just goes to show how these targeted therapies and immunotherapies have just absolutely transformed cancer care with melanoma leading the way. I, I mean, if we can see some of these advances in other cancers and we can maintain, find a way through research to maintain these responses, it's just transformative. Um, so super interesting and also great to hear about the multimodality approach and how it can be combined with radiation. We've got lots of interesting questions for you, so please stick around um, and we'll come back to you shortly. Um, thanks, Tom. So I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Miss Anouk Borg. She is a consultant neurosurgeon here at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery at Queen Square and um, a core member of the pituitary and central skull based surgery unit. So Ms. Borg specializes in complex cranial conditions such as pituitary and skull-based tumors, as well as brain metastases. She has a high volume microsurgical practice, as well as a gamma knife radiosurgery practice, providing this highly specialized care for patients with difficult to treat tumors. And she's going to tell us about one of those difficult to treat tumors today in her talk, Overcoming Challenges in Treating Brain Metastases with Radiosurgery, a single case review. So take it away, Anouk. Thank you, Kieran. <clears throat> As you mentioned, um, what I would like to discuss today is um, a case of brain metastasis that we treated recently here in Queen Square, which we, find, uh, which we found in this case to be particularly challenging so just a brief overview, <clears throat> brain metastasis remain the most common uh, brain tumor in adults. We're always taught in neurosurgery that when you see a space occupying lesion, the most likely diagnosis is brain metastasis. Second most likely is brain metastasis. The third most likely is still brain metastasis. And the most common of these is lung cancer, which um, accounts for around 40 to 50% of cases we treat breast cancer being the second commonest offender. And as we were hearing from the previous talk, melanoma also has a high pr propensity to spread to the brain. 
And brain metastasis, we know that they severely affect patients' quality of life and prognosis. And although prognosis from brain metastasis has improved in recent years, uh, likely driven uh, by advances in systemic therapy, there continues to be uh, poor prognosis for some patients. And these can arise from various challenges. So as we heard from Ian Paddock's talk, we can have complex uh, treatments uh, due to the, um, uh, free, the quantity of metastasis <clears throat> or also due to the high volume. The location of the metastasis can be the challenge to treat, such as locations in the brainstem or in the cella, uh, very close to the optic nerves. And the size of the tumor can limit um, the ability to give the adequate dose that we would like. There's also challenges related to patient factors, such as performance status, that can change during the course of the treatment and their overall health and comorbidities. And so with that in mind, <clears throat> we'll um, review the case um, that we treated here recently. So this was a 72-year-old gentleman, and he was referred during the neurosurgery on call after he presented with confusion and dysphagia to his local hospital. <clears throat> a CT scan was carried out uh, that shows um, this lesion on the left side of the brain that is causing surrounding edema. Uh, by background, he, um, we were told he had non-small cell lung cancer <clears throat> that was treated uh, the year before with radical radiotherapy. He had severe COPD, and after his radiotherapy, he suffered from pneumonitis. He also had other comorbidities, including hypertension, peripheral vascular disease requiring clopidogrel. He was started on steroids and omeprazole by his uh, local hospital. <clears throat> he underwent a restaging uh, CT, chest, abdomen, and pelvis which was reported as showing significant progression of these uh, parenchymal changes in his lung. However, he was discussed in the local lung MDT, and they concluded that there was possibly some regrowth of soft tissue at the site that was originally treated. However, his local oncologist um, discussed his case with us and said that he has reasonable prognosis of more than six months if the brain metastasis is treated. He had further avenues for chemotherapy, he had good performance status and was able to lie down flat and was not on home oxygen. So we agreed to review this patient in clinic. He attended with his wife, but he walked in himself by himself with no support. The steroids had resolved his uh, dysphagia, so he was just CS15 with no neurological deficit. However, he had uh, severe dyspnea at rest and could hardly complete um, sentences. And so he had very poor exercise tolerance. He yeah, underwent an MRI, which you can see here on the left is the T2 sequence that shows significant uh, white matter edema um, as a result of this metastasis. So the reaction in the surrounding brain that this lesion was causing. And on the right, we see the T1 weighted images with contrast. So after gadolinium injection, we can see peripheral enhancement of this um, lesion, which is very in keeping with metastasis with the central area of necrosis, and again, the surrounding edema being caused by uh, this metastasis. And so um, we discussed his case in the Queen's Square um, gamma knife MDT, and this patient was a high anesthetic risk. And although that lesion, uh, so going back to this lesion, it's a, coming to the cortical surface, so looking at it from a surgeon's point of view, access to this lesion is relatively straightforward. However, the main challenge to operate on this lesion would be that it is right in the center of the speech area. So it's uh, left-sided, so dominant hemisphere, and uh, taking this out puts him at risk of causing permanent speech deficit. And if this was a younger, more fit patient, one would even consider doing this awake um, to protect speech. So he was, however, a high anesthetic risk with poor exercise tolerance, and the anesthetists told us that he would not be able to be intubated uh, with, and without needing intensive care and a high risk of not being able to be extubated again. So surgery was out of the question for him. And therefore, gamma knife uh, or radiotherapy was, was the remaining option for him. And when we considered him for gamma knife, the main challenge was the size of the lesion. So already at referral, it was almost three centimeters. 
and that causes radiation dose constraints. And we want to avoid radiating the surrounding brain, uh, especially in this case that it is eloquent brain with those perilesional changes that we've seen in the white matter. And we don't want that to result in a permanent neurological deficit that would make his quality of life worse. And there was also the question on whether his uh, primary tumor was progressive, uh, was progressing, and therefore that lowers the chance of a good outcome. So there are various um, indices that uh, try to predict outcome uh, of patients undergoing uh, radiosurgery. One of the most common used ones is the score index for radiosurgery, which takes into account these prognostic variables, age, performance status, systemic disease status, the volume of the lesion and the number of lesions. And so if we had to work out the score for this gentleman, he would have scored a four, um, given his performance status was just 70 and his largest volume lesion was more than 13 centimeters cubed. And but he had one lesion, so that helps him score two. And with a score of four, that means his median survival was seven months. And so we agreed to uh, go ahead with Gamma Knife. And he attended uh, the unit and uh, had a frame uh, attached and had a repeat MRI. And uh, with the frame on and the up-to-date scan, given that three weeks had passed from him being first referred to him being assessed and booked into Gamma Knife, we can see that the lesion has now grown further and the total volume uh, was 18 centimeters now cubed. And uh, if you remember our uh, sort of limit of volume uh, that we are allowed to treat is 20 centimeters cubed. So this is uh, approaching that limit. And um, therefore, you know, discussion was had um, after this MRI on how to proceed. Our original plan was to give this a uh, single fraction and treat it all in one go. But given the volume, we then agreed to uh, stage the treatment. And so just a quick description to differentiate the terms hypofractionated versus staged treatment. So hypofractionated SRS is giving your dose of radiotherapy divided into daily fractions. And usually we would, this, would do this with a mask. However, in this case, we decided it would be best to proceed with staged SRS. So that means giving him a dose of radiosurgery, bringing him back after a few weeks, re-image and repeat the plan and repeat the treatment and do that over three stages. And that's what we decided to do. So uh, the Vantage frame uh, was applied. Uh, this is a non-metallic glass fiber uh, reinforced epoxy frame. So it's very light and you can see that it has an open uh, face. So for someone who had breathing problems and needed to have oxygen, um, this frame allows for that to, to be applied. And so he attended um, these three sessions. <clears throat> we had a challenge that he was booked in after this uh, first treatment here on the left, two weeks later. However, he was admitted with a chest infection in hospital and required to be uh, on home oxygen. And so that second stage was delayed by a week, but nevertheless, he managed to come in. You may notice that this second MRI does not have a frame attached. Uh, given that he was on oxygen, we carried out the MRI without the frame. Um, and then we did a cone beam CT. Um, and then we referenced that to his MRI to be able to give his accurate treatment. And then he did well. And two weeks later, he came in for his third stage treatment. At each stage, we gave 10 grades to the 46% isodose. And you can see here the uh, response with each stage. So the volume was becoming smaller and therefore we could readjust our plan. And so the 10 grades are then being applied to a smaller volume of tumor thus becoming more effective. And you can see that this surrounding area of um, hyperintensity that initially we weren't sure whether this was tumor or contrast extravasation, but also responded uh, very nicely. And so this last image here on the right is before the third 10 grays were given. 
He then had a repeat scan three months after his treatment, and this has continued to respond. And he is currently still alive and doing well um, four months after his gamma knife radiotherapy. Also importantly, um, you can see here the white metaridema is completely resolved, uh, which was a good um, outcome for him, meaning he could come off the dexamethasone, which was causing him a lot of side effects. And so he now remains off steroids. And so in my overview today, I wanted to show you how sometimes challenges um, for, with, for patients can be overcome by careful selection and being able to be flexible and adopting the treatment to that particular uh, patient to be able to maximize the benefits of gamma knife therapy. And patient-centered MDT discussion, we find is the best way to give optimal management. And thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Anouk. Uh, really interesting case and a wonderful example of how far gamma knife uh, radio surgeries got, uh, come and how it can really uh, treat these large lesions and a beautiful example of how you can see that response over time. So thanks for sharing that case and congratulations on it. Um, so we'll have a brief talk now by our National Brain Appeal Charity. We've got Claire, the Chief Executive Officer from the National Brain Appeal, and we'll follow that with a series of questions. So thanks, Claire. Thanks very much. My main role here this evening is to listen and learn um, as much as I possibly can. I've been with the National Brain Appeal just, just for a year now. I'm at my first anniversary of that. Um, and we've been around for about 40 years. Well, actually, exactly 40 years. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. But over the last um, 18 months, we've doubled our income from £3 million a year to £7 million in the past year. So we re things really, the pace for us is really picking up dramatically. We're extremely ambitious. Um, we exist entirely to support Queen's Square. So that's the Institute of Neurology and the, the National um, Hospital. Um, we, we exist purely to support all areas of the research and the delivery, service delivery, um, patient experience and physical environment. So currently, just to... To give you a bit of uh, context, currently our two big appeals are uh, focusing on Grays Inn Road, which is a, a hybrid um, facility that is being developed by UCL, University College London, um, but it will also have a presence, will also have an outpatients department from um, UCLH, um, particularly the National Hospital. So we are raising around seven million pounds for that project and predominantly focusing on three areas. And those are the MRI suite, uh, the patient engagement um, research hub. So we really need to increase the number of patients who are participating in all kinds of research um, from sort of data driven research right the way through to clinical trials. And then also the um, stem cell research facility. Simultaneously, we're just winding up another appeal for um, rare dementias. So we have we fund and have been funding for a long time now a rare dementia support service um, for patients um, with, with rare dementias, working with Professor Nick Fox on that. Um, but we have fund, uh, fundraised over the last couple of years to create a centre where they can come together. Um, services can be delivered from that centre both um, follow-up services, services for patients and their families, um, that's regular support groups, and we will bring in sort of guest visitors as well um, so that people can really come together uh, with, with experts from sort of from the national, but from a wider realm as well. And it's the first of its kind internationally. And we envisage that being completed by the end of 2025. Um, in terms of neuro-oncology specifically, or, or brain tumours, I should say, probably um, more specifically, we've got a very rich history in terms of supporting those projects um, at Queen Square. So in both 2011 and then and more recently, in 2017, we funded the Molly Lane Fox unit. Um, and that really helped us to develop um, 
a unit that focused on diagnoses and treatment and care of brain cancer patients. And in 2017, as I say, we developed that further still and we doubled the size of that unit so that patients, as well as accessing those unique services, can also um, participate in the, in the pioneering drug trials that we're undertaking in that unit as well. More recently, we funded some more um, we have something called the Innovation Fund, and through that fund, we have funding funded a surgical navigation tool for skull-based surgery, and also developing a smart tool for keyhole brain surgery. So those two things have really been um, more recent projects, but something that you might already be familiar with. Um, and then just this year, we have awarded two more grants from our Innovation Fund, um, and one of those is for developing a new IA tool, I, AI, <laughs> AI tool um, that will help interpret MRI scans um, more objectively and more quickly and we anticipate that if that when that starts to bear fruit it will save over 700 hours of clinicians time in terms of interpreting those scans meaning that patients have to have fewer scans which will benefit 200 patients a year. And then lastly, the project that we've most recently funded is improving access to clinical trials for brain tumour patients using AI. So currently, only 20% of our patients are offered um, a trial, but using AI to assess their eligibility data, we anticipate that we will be able to increase that significantly as we're able to screen their eligibility more efficiently. And that's it from me. Thanks very much, Claire. We're really very grateful to be in partnership with you and um, all the fantastic work that you do for our patients in terms of supporting our clinical care and our research. So we, we really are very grateful um, uh, and it's a fantastic organisation. So um, please do look them up if you've got any interest in supporting um, clinical care or research in the brain tumour areas or um, neurology in general. So um, I, we've got the panel back. Thanks for staying around, everyone. We're just going to crack on and get through as many of these questions as we can in the last 10 minutes or so of this webinar. Um, so let's make a start. So uh, I think we can probably bring them up on the screen as we go. But the first question I've got is probably one for you, Ian, if you're happy to take it. You mentioned something about this. So the question um, is for multiple treatments or retreatments, um, are small lesions themselves, can we retreat them? Can we retreat those small lesions that have already been treated in the past? Uh, absolutely, that's, that's not a problem. Um, as I, I mentioned, the RTOG 1905 study was uh, uh, effectively um, a, a dose escalation study looking at retreatment of, of brain nets, although um, in that case they haven't had previous radio surgery, which obviously gives a, a much higher biological effective dose. But um, certainly we can, we can retreat them. I've been involved in, in second treatments and e even third treatments, but you know, you've got to make sure that it is uh, a recurrence and not radionecrosis, which can appear like a recurrence. Um, so you have to make sure that you've got the correct diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question is, um, do we have any experience of neoadjuvant SRS? So perhaps this is um, one that I can start to address and anyone can jump in who wants. So we certainly do have experience with that. It's not our routine practice. Um, just what we mean by neoadjuvant SRS is essentially when someone has a, a metastasis, it's treating it with radio surgery before traditional surgery to remove that metastasis. So there's several benefits to doing that. You have a well delineated volume. You can see the metastases and the border of it very clearly. So it gives you good, clear treatment target. Um, you don't have to wait to treat any other metastases for the patient to recover from surgery. However, the downside is you're, you're having to treat a large volume and essentially treat a lot of tumor that you're essentially going to cut out and remove anyway. Um, and the associated complications you might get from treating a large metastasis. Um, uh, would anyone else like to make any comment about that? I think it's an ongoing area of research, isn't it? It's something that people are very interested in. Ian. You know, I, I think this is a really interesting subject and there has been a study to show that actually if you 
if you treat them in a neoadjuvant um, fashion as opposed to treating the, the post-resection cavity, you're actually treating a smaller volume, which is counterintuitive, but the, the, the studies suggest that that's the case. And of course, if you're treating before resection, you're reducing the risk of leptomeningeal spread uh, dramatically. So I, I think this is a really exciting uh, area of SRS. And uh, we're holding a British Radio Surgery Society um, meeting in January, a quick plug there. And, and, and that's one of the subjects that will be topics that we'll be covering. That's great. And it ties in very nicely with the next question, actually, um, from Sarah Mead, which is, is there any role for preoperative SRS to a larger lesion, for example, four centimetres, in the presence of other smaller lesions? I suppose this is a, a somewhat related question, and it, it, it also emphasises the timing of radiosurgery. So particularly in the case where we know a large metastases need surgery. For example, it's too large for, for um, stereotyped radiosurgery, but they have other metastases, how we fit that together. So we don't want to treat the radiosurgery to the smaller metastases and give them time to grow. So do we treat them before the surgery or do we treat them after the surgery? And I think personally, I would find it hard to give a one um, size fits all answer to that. That's why we have a gamma knife um, multidisciplinary team meeting. We have a neurooncology multidisciplinary team meeting with experts such as the panel here today so that we can really take a, a nuanced view of what the best treatment is for the individual patient. But sometimes we will treat in advance um, with radio surgery and sometimes after traditional surgery. That would be my feeling. Um, so uh, next, um, the next question is um, for you, Ian. Based on your extensive experience working with gamma knife patients, um, they're, they're asking a question about average survival extension for metastatic patients. That's that's a challenging question, isn't it? I suppose too, it depends on the devils in the detail. And I don't have experience on that. Mm. I, I used to follow patients up in, in the old days. I've got some great data from sort of, uh, well, pre-2000, actually. Um, but, um, uh, you know, it, it, with systemic therapies nowadays, um, I have no idea yeah. what the answer is there. Tom, you gave some interesting graphs about um, progression-free survival. Um, do you have a feel on that? I suppose um, perhaps I could simplify the question and say, you know, is it still the case that most patients with metastatic brain tumors die from the brain tumors? Is that ultimately um, the, the, the primary challenge we're dealing with, or are we actually able to get on top of the brain disease now? So I would say from a melanoma perspective that we certainly warn patients who have brain disease at presentation that, that it's not a good thing and that we know that across the spectrum of trials, one of the problems is patients with brain disease are often excluded from some of the trials who so are extrapolating data from other studies. But pe people certainly do much better than they used to. So the combination of giving gamma knife, which can give really good local control, together with immunotherapy, which we know has efficacy within the brain for lesions we can't see. We know it can be effective against extracranial disease. Giving those things together means that some patients are doing much better than they used to. So I think what I would say is quite bluntly is that having brain metastases is not, not the death sentence it once was for lots of our patients. It's very encouraging news, isn't it? Um, uh, one of the questions which I'm, um, which which I discuss with you a lot, it's something that comes up because so many melanoma patients are on some immunotherapy or BRAF targeted therapy now. Um, often there's a decision about the timing of that. So when someone's found to have new brain metastases, do we go straight for gamma knife or do we trial immunotherapy first? What what kind of things go through your mind when you're making that decision? Really good question. So a couple of things, really. So one thing is when have these occurred? So is this a patient we have just met who has brain disease at presentation and has had no treatments before? So we know that their melanoma is completely treatment naive. So the outcomes of, of how they're going to do with treatment are based on some of the trials that we know about. It's very different from patients whose melanoma brain mets occur when they're on treatment. So people who develop brain met after having immunotherapy, people who develop brain met on targeted treatment, these people will do much worse. So we would want to jump in with gamma knife much earlier in those patients than we would in people who were asymptomatic and completely treatment naive. The other caveat is, of course, the number, the burden, how big they are, those sorts of things. So although I did talk about the fact that with 
in patients up front with asymptomatic disease, we have the option of giving immunotherapy and holding gamma knife. I think we get a bit nervous doing that if people have a, a fair number of lesions. So we often, if they've got a few lesions lying around, we're a bit nervous holding. So we tend to be more comfortable holding and waiting to see what happens if people have got one or two compared to if they've got kind of five or between five and ten. Uh, and I think you mentioned it a little bit in your talk, Tom, but what's what's the problem with just giving both together, just staying on immunotherapy and treating with gamma knife at the same time? So um, I suppose one of the things we are trying to do, given that we're giving people a, a good chance of living long term, is, is minimise the risk of the treatments. And I think Ian's touched on it before. Sometimes what we think is progression is radionecrosis. And although some people can get radionecrosis, which is completely asymptomatic, you know, there are cases of people who are symptomatic and have significant problems with radionecrosis. And it's quite a hard problem to manage. Although it occurs in a minority of people, it is something that we need to think about. Um, and again, you know, we've talked about B, the BRAF therapy we have. We know that's radiosensitizing. So if you just plow on with that and give gamma knife on top, the, 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 re the rates of radionecrosis are higher if, unless you pause it around the radiotherapy. So thinking about the complications of all the treatments you're giving is really important. Great. So the next question is about um, treating small isolated hemorrhagic mets, for example, you know, as melanoma is often the case. Uh, it's really uh, a question from Ryan about what's the problem with that? Why are we often as clinicians um, hesitant to treat small multiple bleeds? Um, uh, with with probable underlying tumours. Um, what's the problem with that? And why do we often recommend delayed imaging, for example, waiting six weeks for the hemorrhage to um, resolve and then going ahead with the treatment? So perhaps I can start answering that and then anyone who has any comments. I suppose th the thinking I would have about that is that um, when you have an area of hemorrhage, so bleeding, it can be difficult to see the extent of the tumours underlying it. So um, it's true that if it's very small, that you, you know that there's a small volume there. However, it's difficult to target that accurately. And it may be the case, as we sometimes see, that once the hemorrhage resolves, that there is no evidence of viable metastases underneath it. And so, um, in effect, you'd be treating something unnecessarily. I don't have any data for this, but also Gamma Knife is a, um, it's a powerful tool. The radiation is powerful enough to kill those tumor cells. That's how it works. And so irradiating um, a, a region of brain that has hemorrhaged may have some risk associated with that. So what we don't want to do is aggravate that area of hemorrhage and cause a further hemorrhage or side effects associated with that. So those are the kind of thoughts I have about why we might not treat um, an area of acute hemorrhage. I don't know whether anyone else has any um, thoughts in addition. Any experience with that? I, I th Kieran, I, I think you're right. Um, if you've got a, a larger lesion, then you certainly, uh, and uh, if you wait a while and that the hemorrhagic portion is reabsorbed and, and there's no viable tumor in there, then that's, that's great. Um, I, I have read a study, I can't quote it, um, showing that radio surgery does actually protect against further hemorrhage. I know there is some, some reluctance for, for, by some clinicians to, to, to treat with radio surgery, but um, you know, the, the best thing to do is treat these lesions um, because then they won't hemorrhage. Hmm. Great. So I, I think um, in the interest of time, I might make this the last question, um, being respectful of, of everyone's time. Um, we have a question here related to um, staged radio surgery, which um, Ms. Borg gave a good example of. So the question is um, from Christian, um, and it's when do you consider patients, um, oh, sorry, uh, excuse me. Mm. Yeah, let's. Uh, we've we've talked about um, it's from that already. Marina, I believe. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, Marina, <clears throat> go ahead. Yes. Anu. Um. So yeah. So I think the point of my talk was to be uh, to design the treatment according to the patient and give very individualized treatment. And so uh, for that particular patient, the giving the treatment every two weeks. 
and um, giving the and target dose which was 30 gray. Um, we don't want to prolong the treatment unnecessarily, <clears throat> but also we want to give time for the brain to recover um, and also the logistics around returning to hospital, um, but also being flexible. So we developed a chest infection between the first two stages. That doesn't mean that he has now missed the boat and we cannot treat. So there's no particular guideline that we follow, but we adopt it according to the number of mets. So if that particular patient had to have uh, other small metastases, for example, we may have given those um, treatment in one single fraction and then staged the bigger volume. Um, so that's what I would answer to that question. I don't know if Ian, you have any other comments about stage treatment? Well, th this is a, a really interesting um, area for, for future research because we don't know what the optimal timing is. You know, two, two weeks was what Higuchi suggested. I think it was just convenience. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we know that um, the, the longer you wait, you're going to get uh, further shrinkage of the tumour, more reoxygenation. In fact, we did have one patient at Queen Square that for other medical reasons um, delayed their retreatment, I think by, it was about six weeks between each of the stages. And they had uh, much more, uh, greater shrinkage of their, their tumour than um, we would normally expect in two weeks. So we don't actually know what the optimal timing is, uh, and that makes it a very exciting uh, area for future research. So I'd just like to finish by thanking the panel, um, Claire, Ian, Tom, Anouk. Thanks for coming and speaking. Thank you to everyone for attending and for Amethyst Radio Th Surgery for hosting, and hopefully you can join us at our next webinar. Have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.